theories of the business cycle. Economists have recognized for several years that business cycles do exist and they keep coming up with theories that try to explain the business cycle. Until the 1930s, economists believed that business cycles were a natural feature of the economy and recessions were temporary. In other words, economists believed that the economy should not be interfered with and it would correct on its own. But the Great Depression changed that view and gave rise to new schools of economic thought. Let's go through the various theories or schools of economic thought that you need to be aware of and recognize the fact that we are not becoming experts in these theories. We are just understanding the few major points so that you can answer questions on the exam. Section 3.1 deals with the neoclassical theories and the Austrian schools of thought. The basic premise of the neoclassical school is that markets will reach equilibrium because of the invisible hand or free markets. And this is the traditional view. It essentially says that the government should not interfere because the market will correct itself. According to this theory, eventually all resources will be used efficiently based on this principle that eventually companies will produce such that marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. In other words, companies will adjust so as to maximize their profits. This theory recognizes that if an economic shock shifts the aggregate demand curve or the short run aggregate supply curve, then the economy will quickly readjust and reach the equilibrium via lower interest rates and lower wages. A related school of thought is the Austrian school of thought, which largely agreed with the neoclassical model, but focused more on the impact of money and government. And all you really need to know here is the fact that according to this theory, the government should stay out or the government should not really intervene in the economy because fluctuations in the economy or fluctuations in the business cycle are caused by the government's expansionary monetary policies. At times you will see the phrase that fluctuations are caused by the government's misguided policies. Next we come to section 3.2 which deals with the Keynesian theory and then the monetarist theory. First let's talk about the Keynesian school of thought. This school of thought was put forward by John Maynard Keynes in the wake of the Great Depression. The Great Depression demonstrated the fact that the economy got into a recession and then automatically did not come out. So clearly the neoclassical model did not explain what was going on. The Keynesian school focuses on the aggregate demand fluctuations and one major premise is that wages are downward sticky because of which the economy does not easily come out of a recession. So if I were to draw the pictures that we saw in the previous reading where we have price level on the y-axis, real GDP on the x-axis, let's say this is potential GDP and for some reason the economy is in a recession. So real GDP is over here. Now Potentially, the economy could come out of a recession if people were willing to accept lower wages and then the aggregate supply would shift to the right because then wages would be lower and companies would be willing to hire more people. But according to this theory, wages are downward sticky. People do not like wage cuts. They would rather be unemployed in the short run. So we are stuck over here. This is one point. The other point is that if somehow workers do accept lower wages, we would still have a problem because the consumption would be low. People would still be in a depression mode or economic downturn mode 
And because of that view, aggregate demand would still be low. You can think of the fact that if wages are low, even then aggregate demand will be low. So in any case, we would be stuck over here, which is giving us a recessionary gap. We are below the potential GDP. One proposed solution might be to lower interest rates. In other words, to try to kick the economy out of this situation by using lower interest rates. But according to the Keynesian school of thought, that in of itself will not work because business confidence and business investment would still remain low. And the concept of animal instincts where psychological factors kick in and people in general have low confidence in the economic situation, so they will hold back on spending and consumption. So according to the Keynesian view, governments should use both monetary policy and fiscal policy to kick the economy out of this situation. And what the government should try to do, according to the Keynesians, is keep capital and labor employed even if this means a large fiscal deficit. Keynes agreed with the neoclassical and Austrian schools about economy being self-correcting. But the major distinction is that according to John Maynard Keynes, this takes a very long time. And he famously mentioned at some point that in the long run, we are all dead. The implication being that it's not worth creating so much suffering. We need to use all the tools at our disposal to try to get ourselves out of a recessionary trap. Now I want you to do example 7 from the curriculum. Note that this example is essentially a reading exercise, so it is less important compared to other examples where we have actual MCQ questions. Next, we come to the monetarist school. The monetarist school objected to Keynesian intervention for four reasons, and you need to know these four reasons. First of all, the Keynesian model does not recognize the importance of money supply. Second issue is that the Keynesian model lacks complete representation of utility maximizing agents. And we'll see this concept again later. By utility maximizing agents or representation of these agents, what we mean is the following. The major agents in the economy are households and firms. And as we studied in microeconomics, households will operate under a budget and households will try to maximize their utility, firms try to maximize profits, and these aspects impact the overall economy. The Keynesian model does not take these facts into account or does not give enough representation to these facts. The Keynesian model fails to consider the long-term costs of government intervention. So, the Keynesian model recognizes the fact that there will be a fiscal deficit if the government is using fiscal policy, either reducing taxes or increasing spending. Clearly, that will create a deficit. In the long run, that deficit can have a detrimental effect, but the Keynesian model does not think about that. And finally, the timing of the government's economic policy response is uncertain. So, if the policy response involves increased spending and lower taxes, by the time that policy has an impact on the real economy, the economy might be out of the recession anyway. So the policy then might actually have a negative impact on the economy. It might cause the economy to be overheated and cause inflation to be out of control. So monetarists say that these are the four issues with the Keynesian school of thought. So what then do the monetarists say? First of all, they say that the policy, especially monetary policy, should be clear and consistent. And there should be a limited role of the government. So there should be limited fiscal policy. As far as the monetary policy is concerned, we should have a situation where the money supply is kept 
steady and at a predictable rate. As we will see in the next reading, the intent is to keep money supply in line with potential GDP growth. This school of thought recognizes that business cycles occur because of exogenous shocks, for example, changes in technology, changes in cost structures, and maybe because of government intervention. So what is suggested is that the government should let the aggregate demand and aggregate supply find its own equilibrium rather than risking further economic fluctuation. The New Classical School New classical macroeconomic models emphasize that economic agents should be represented with a utility function and a budget constraint. And this is material that we saw in microeconomics, and I just alluded to this matter. Whenever you see this term new, that means that we need to consider the microeconomic fundamentals when coming up with macroeconomic models. And by microeconomic fundamentals, we mean the fact that households are looking to maximize utility, households are operating under constraints, companies or firms are trying to maximize profits, and so on. For simplicity, we assume that all agents are roughly alike. Under new classical macroeconomic models, we have two flavors, models without money and models with money. The major model without money is the real business cycle theory, because this is concerned with the real economic variables in an economy. That's why it's called the real business cycle theory. This emphasizes the effect of real economic variables, such as changes in technology and external shocks. In this model, the aggregate supply is also extremely important. Note that in the Keynesian model, we focused largely on aggregate demand. Expansions and contractions represent efficient operation of the economy in response to external shocks. Therefore, the government should not intervene with monetary and fiscal policy. And finally, in terms of models with money, these models build on the RBC, RBC being real business cycle theory. So they build on RBC models, but recognize the role of monetary policy. You will see some questions that allude to the neo-Keynesian or the new Keynesian model. These models build on microeconomic principles, but say that frictions in the economy may prevent convergence and therefore the government and therefore government intervention should be necessary. Now, in terms of remembering some of this material, as I mentioned before, whenever you see the term new, immediately what should come to your mind is that new means the greater use of microeconomics in macroeconomic models. The moment you see Keynesian, immediately that should trigger the fact that the government should intervene, especially with fiscal policy. In fact, government should do whatever it can to get an economy out of a recession. Now do example eight, which is extremely important because this has some MCQ questions. On this slide, I have summarized the various schools of thought. Nothing new over here, but many students have trouble remembering the various schools of thought. So I have listed the one or two most important items associated with each theory. Neoclassical was the original theory. It believes that market forces or the invisible hand will automatically correct. Therefore, the recommended policy is do nothing. Do nothing might be a little strong term, but it does get the point across. Largely, when we say do nothing, this means that government intervention should be as little as possible. With the Austrian thought, you can think of this as simply building on the neoclassical school, and it gives more importance to the government and monetary policy. But 
The major point is that according to this theory, fluctuations are caused by misguided government intervention. So the most sensible thing that the government can do is not to intervene. Then we have the Keynesian view, which focuses on the aggregate demand curve. According to the Keynesian view, the economy will not automatically correct in the short run. So the government should use fiscal policy and monetary policy to get the economy out of the recession. If the government does not do this, then we might be stuck in the recession for a while. And just as a side remark, most people who devise the US economic policy are strongly influenced by the Keynesian schools of thought. The monetarist view is based on monetary policy and that should be easy to remember. The basic prescription here is that the monetary authority should maintain a steady and predictable growth of money supply. Under new classical models, the most important one that you need to be aware of is the RBC model. And according to this, expansions and contractions represent efficient operation of the economy in response to external shocks. And the best thing for the government to do is nothing or more generally, the government should minimize its intervention. Now I want you to read example nine from the curriculum. It doesn't exactly relate to what we are talking about, so I'm not sure why the curriculum has this particular example over here, but it's a very short read and it is useful in general.